years ago, I was asked to go and speak at a uh, conference for the wardens of a Christian housing charity. Okay? And I kept on trying and trying to find the right text that I was supposed to preach on. I kept coming back to this particular text, which was basically saying to these wardens, preach the gospel to these Christian people who are all in your care. I thought this has got to be wrong. This is going to be down like a lead balloon. And I went along and I did it. It was up in England. And I went along and I did that. And they, they were absolutely taken with the thought that they never thought of this. There were all these folks. And, you know, elderly people get cranky just because they're elderly. They might be Christian as well. I mean, it should, the Christian bit should have a bearing, you know. But um, <laughs> I'm understating it. But having said that, it happens. You know, and they, their major focus was with cranky people. And actually, their major focus ought to have been on tell them about the love of Jesus. Now, that, that was interesting to me. And it was an in, interesting insight for me to gain. But look, it's in this passage we're looking at in Acts 17 today. The religious, and they cut up a bit rough in the passage, they need evangelizing too. There can easily be a tendency to think otherwise, certainly in this part of Wales. They certainly won't appreciate you for doing it. And let's face it, reaching out to out and out pagans and secularists, even in the churches that we belong to, seems a lot more sort of attractive and appealing. I was told recently that the valleys are utterly godless because they've got the highest percentage of people putting no religion on the census form. And I started to think about that. Are they the hardest people to reach then? <laughs> Some of the worst sinners that Christ ever berated were the hypocrites adhering to the churches. I thought the valleys are the hardest because the people know nothing about God, just as many in and around the chapels of you know, this part of the world don't know. But here, up here, we're not dealing with the unknown. They don't know. We're dealing with the unknown unknown. They think they know, but they don't. So before you can get anywhere, you've got to deal with this not Christianity that's in the way. You're not dealing with the God-shaped hole in people because the parking place has been taken. When people state no religion, there is a known and perceived void, Augustine's God-shaped hole, a neat, ready parking berth that the Gospel readily slots into. But here there's no parking place. Because the interloping religion of the ages, not Christianity, shall we call it, fills all the parking places. <coughs> now, I know we've said for some time that perhaps the four ways into our local culture here with the Gospel look like the four R's. Rugby, ruminants, renewables for all the hippie types, and religion. <coughs> and we've said we can deal with three of those, but the fourth one is actually a, a blocked up doorway. Religion is a blocked up doorway. Here's Paul, Silas, and Timothy in this passage of scripture beating their head on the bricks. And with surprising results by the end of the day. We need to be careful. I, mean, I still think that's very much the case, but we need to be careful because of Acts 17. So let's challenge what we're thinking and see how it works out. Where's Paul? He's in Thessalonica synagogue. What happens here? A church is planted in Thessalonica. Out of mission team, sheep stealing is it? Around the synagogue? We've seen that. We've seen sheep stealing happening. We've heard that accusation in the heart of Wales too. Not about us, but about others. I don't know what anybody else says about this. But the question that applies when people raise this charge of sheep stealing and taking people away, the question that applies has to be this, doesn't it? Are you stealing sheep from shepherds or are you rescuing them from wolves? If it's the latter, you don't need to worry about the accusation because God will take a view. If it's the former, you might have a problem because you could well be hampering and, and tampering with something that he's been doing uh, that you shouldn't be tampering with. Let's take a very quick look at Thessalonica. Here's a map. As you can see in the bright sunlight, you can't see it. However, there is a very significant and important road that runs from here, Black Sea Bosphorus region, right the way across here to this place with an unpronounceable name. And that then leads into a ferry that goes into Brindisi, which we know about because there's still a ferry there. So this is the road that leads from Rome across 
Asia Minor and into the east, out to the Black Sea, to across the southern Gulf. <coughs> and Paul and his travelling companions are setting out along that road. They've come across into Europe. They've landed at Philippi, here, and they're travelling along the Apollos, Amphipolis, Amphipolis, Apollonia, into Thessalonica, which is here. They're travelling this via Ignatia. Paul appears to be on his way to Rome. And you know he was trying to get to Rome to preach the gospel of the empire all the time. And God was saying, stop, 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 slow down, slow down, poke into the place here, poke into the post, place there. You go where I send you. Very important trading centre on that road. Historic, long road, very important for linking Rome to its possessions in the east. They come in at Philippi, and Thessalonica, about 62 miles west of Philippi, they stop perhaps overnight at Amphipolis, then it sounds like they stay overnight at Apollonia. They surely need to be on horses to be travelling at this rate, by the way. It's interesting, isn't it? Making use of the technology. And uh, then they end up at Thessalonica, where they put in a longer stay, three weeks at least, just with the synagogue people, and then more with the others, before it all kicks off, and it gets difficult to stay there. So just who were these people that they were intentionally evangelising? Well, as usual, in the absence of a Christian church, Paul puts in his appearance at the Jewish synagogue on the Sabbath. And having probably been invited as a visiting, visiting scribe to address the congregation, much as he had been in Pisidian Antioch before now, he expounds the scriptures there over the course of the next three Sabbath days. How does Paul express intentionality here? This is about intentional evangelism. Sharing our faith with, because we mean to do so. The people we mean to contact and share our faith with. How does he do that? Are we sure this is intentional evangelism? How do you get asked to preach when you turn up at the synagogue? I've been to Sydney, they didn't ask me to preach. They know you. They're forbid of you. Well, have they? Interesting if they have, because, well, it, 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 we can't rule it out. Mm -hmm. What we know Paul did was he wore a certain robe. Mm -hmm. We know he wore a certain robe. And when a visiting rabbi turned up, and was qualified and got his wings and everything. He gave wings got a robe. And when he turned up in a visit, as a visitor in a synagogue, he'd wear a robe and he'd be asked to speak. So we know that's in the cultural expectation. Paul could do that. There's something interesting on this in 2 Timothy 4. Right? So there's Paul in prison, but he's planning to get out. Do your best to come to me quickly, for Demas, because he loved this world, has deserted me and has gone, actually, into that with Thessalonica. Prescott has gone to Galatia, Titus to Dalmatia. Only Luke is with me. Get Mark. We're really with you because he's helpful to me in my ministry. Let's have the team back together again. When you come, bring the cloak that I left with Carpus at Troas and my scrolls, especially the parchments. There's Paul's Jewish evangelism kit. His robe, his scrolls and his parchment. These are what a scribe is going to need to get into the synagogue to start off somewhere and see if we can pick up to try and bring a group together. Here's Paul's Jewish evangelism. His cloak, his scrolls, his parchments. Most English commentators say to you, poor man, he was in prison, it must have been cold at night, he wanted his cloak. But in England, I suppose, you know, historic commentators, they think of needing your overcoat. Especially if you go to church, of course, because it's freezing. But he's in prison, so he's going to need his cloak. So what does he want the parchments for? Is he going to start a fire and warm himself? What's that all about? And there's more than that going on here. There's something more than that. Here's how Paul finds a congregation for his preaching ready-made every Sabbath day. He turns up dressed like the scribe with the scrolls and his parchments and his cloak on. That's what he is. And he turns up there like that and the synagogue's president asks him to preach. Paul is anticipating, hoping, praying, preparing for release. In Thessalonica, what sort of people is he preaching to? Well, three groups are identified in the scriptures here for us. Gathered around, though not part necessarily of the synagogue itself. They were Jews, well they were part of it. There were Gentile God-fearers who haven't yet converted to Judaism, but are really interested. And there were influential, prominent women. What's that about? It's fascinating stuff, I'm going to be quick. The majority of Paul's converts in those days were not predominantly Jewish at all, but they were the God-fearers around the edge of the synagogue. The Jews hoped would join Judaism, but were drawn away by Paul's preaching into Christianity. So what was it that Paul was doing there? He was picking up on people who were kind of prepared, being prepared by God already for something. 
Where do they go? There's no church there. Where do they go? They go to the synagogue. And the synagogue was proving very appealing in this way. We'll see a bit more about that maybe in a minute. What does Paul do with them? What was his message with those people? Firstly, he says the Messiah had to suffer. First major point detailed in the passage, listed on the power. Messiah had to suffer. Messiah had to be raised from the dead. This Messiah is Jesus. Now he's teaching them, the content that he's teaching them is all Old Testament scripture. He's taking these religious people to the Bible. If we're talking to the religious around churches and chapels, the content of our message to them, it's not creation and evolution, it's not the Big Bang Theory, it's not any of that stuff. We take it to the Bible they're supposed to believe. That's an interesting one, isn't it? They may not yet have seen the significance of all of this. They may not actually be believing all this, but they're supposed to. Start there. Start there. Paul preaches the Old Testament. He clearly doesn't take such attack in front of the Areopagus in Athens, which is coming next in this chapter. But here, before those who ought to believe, but as he knows secretly do not, he presumes they do until they admit it. First of all, he preaches the Old Testament. Secondly, he uses a pesher form of argument from the Old Testament world. And we can do this too. I'm telling you now. I'm glad you're interested. So, thanks for the question. So what he says is, that there is this. Here. That there with Jesus, that there with what's... It's this here. Look, it's in the book. That there is this here. Now that's a great way to be dealing with people who have a churchy background, isn't it? Religious people, this is what we do with them. We say, that there, look! What you're seeing is, is here in the Bible. The Messiah had to suffer. The Messiah had to be raised from the dead. The Messiah is Jesus. That there is this here. It's Jesus. The scriptures stand fulfilled in Jesus plus no one. So now comes the killer punch. The one who did what the Messiah was destined to do is the one we now know as Jesus. And that was the content of Paul's message to the religious. The reason that the one who fulfilled the Old Testament prophecies was the one he met on the Damascus Road. Did you notice? He does not tell them about the Damascus Road. He tells them about the Bible they believe. Mm -hmm. Fascinating, isn't it? Fascinating. You know, if we had a testament like Paul, we'd be whacking straight in there, wouldn't we? You know, this is it, boys. Oh, I was down the road. No, 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 no. They accept the authority of Scripture. They don't accept the authority of Paul. He described, he said, yeah, no, hang on. Don't look to me. Look to this. Tell them about the book. The significance of the stuff you do believe on the basis of historically observable fact, then he says, will be this, you'll follow Jesus. So Paul stayed there and preaches for three weeks. That was the message, what was the strategy? He reasoned with them for three weeks in the Sabbath. Three weeks he stayed, persisting. And he reasoned with them, he explained and he proved. That's what the reasoning consists of. Explaining and proving. One of those words is paratithemi. It means to put one thing alongside another. So he's taking the Old Testament, he's putting that alongside the life of Jesus, and he's saying, look at this! He's reasoning, he's explaining, he's proving. Rational, biblical reasoning. And here's how we deal with the religious. Yesterday, in a farm, the people who say they believe, Do some daily readings. Read this. Read what this guy's saying about this bit of Bible. Do one every day. I won't be here. You do it. And I'll come back and ask questions. <laughs> I'll be asking questions. Okay. So that's the people. That's the place. That's the people. That's the message. That's the strategy. What about the response? See, I fear, and you know this because I said this right at the beginning, I fear the thing we most dread about intentional evangelism, deliberately telling people about Jesus. The thing we most dread, which keeps us from diving into it with biblical relish, 
is that we might get a biblical response when we do. We hold back from diving into explaining Jesus and presenting Jesus to people because we think we'll get back for it what they got back for doing it in the Bible. And that's exactly the response Paul gets in the synagogue of Thessalonica. It is nothing if not biblical. First of all, there are people who are persuaded. Funny enough, people don't get persuaded if you don't do this. Odd, isn't it? Odd enough. Yeah, they might, well, you see this as a, as a strategy with churches sometimes. We, we, we have the best party on a Sunday, so come to this. And of course we do. And we have, you know, X, Y, Z going on. Come, to this. come and join this tribe. Here's some lovely, nice, kind people. Come and just come and be with us. Have a cup of tea. You want a sermon? Have a cup of tea on this. It's very important. We have tea and biscuits, don't we? It's important. But unless there's that deliberate communication of Christ, funny enough, people don't get persuaded. If you don't persuade them, they don't get persuaded. Is that fair? People are not one for Christ until they're following him either. Because look, these people were persuaded, verse 4b, and they joined Paul and Silas. How do you know they were persuaded? Because they joined Paul and Silas. Now this is important too, because sometimes we encounter people, we've done this over, over many years, they're persuaded but nothing changes. Are they persuaded then? Biblically we count it when they join Paul and Silas. It is not enough in our intentional evangelism, knowing the fear of the Lord, to attempt to persuade men. Persuasion must result in practical following. And people are not one for Christ until they're following Christ with his followers. The call to follow Christ is the call to follow Christ with his people. Think back to Jesus back in Matthew 4. He goes to the fishermen by the lake and he calls groups of them. And they come and follow him together. Our intentional evangelism then must aim to bring people along, not with me, but with Christ and his people, where they can be discipled and grow with his people. So the first response to Paul's intentional evangelism was that people were persuaded to become followers of Christ together. The second is that we must never allow the second is that we must never allow to condition or colour our responses and our mood. Because while some are persuaded, some were threatened and jealous. If you start explaining the gospel to people in churches, religious organisations or whatever. There will be those who feel threatened and there are those who will be jealous. And they'll have a crack at you. Look what Paul and Silas have done. They've taken the most promising hopes for becoming proselytes and they've dissuaded them away into Christianity. Not everybody was going to be pleased. Persuaded them away because the synagogue authorities had decided they've got too much to lose. And they stepped away from acknowledging the authority of God's word. Then they get threatened, it's not good for you, and it wasn't good for them. Other Jews were jealous, verse 5, so they rounded up some bad characters from the marketplace, they formed the mob, and they started a riot in the city. Oh, very spiritual response, well done. Now we know what's in your hearts. Expect to get jealousy, not from the religious, but from the religious who will not listen to Jesus. That's an important distinction, isn't it? Now, okay, the point is made, but it's made also by contrast at Berea, because what happens is that Paul and Silas preach, the mob gathers, it gathers outside Jason's house, it looks as if Jason's house is where the new believers were being gathered, the synagogue was where the evangelism was happening, and Jason, a name often taken by somebody whose actual name was Joshua in those days, in the greco roman world, Jason had him in his house then to teach him some more. And the mob goes to Jason's house and a riot kicks off because Paul and Silas are not there. And so Jason and co are hauled up, the locals are hauled up in front of the city's magistrates. We can detail that, how that fits historically. It's all the way things were at that time in the empire. And they're bound over to keep the peace. You're going to be responsible. If peace doesn't break out around these people, Jason and you guys, you are responsible. We will take it out of you. The only thing Paul and Silas can do is leave. Or well, the new believers are going to get it even more in the neck than they had it before. So they take the road, they take the Ignatian way out of town, and wisely enough, they seem to hook a left. 
and they head south down the road towards Achaea to Berea. Berea, a place described by Cicero as an out-of-the-way town. <laughs> and they love it. They go down to Berea, and what do they do? They do exactly the same thing. They go into the synagogue. How is the message responded to there? Well, the message is responded to there by being taken and brought to the acid test of Scripture. Some people, some people up in Thessalonica have responded like that. But it's a much more common response that appears in this synagogue down in Berea. Again, around the edges of the synagogue, there were what Wales would call tidy people. Trying to turn from the corruption of their times and the sinfulness of their own hearts. How do you identify them? They were eager to search the scriptures to see if what the apostle was saying was true. And many of them did, believed, as did also a number of prominent Greek women and many Greek men. Now look, this is what we were alluding to earlier on in the case of Thessalonica. There was quite an interest in Jewish monotheism amongst upper class pagan Greco-Roman women in the things that they saw in Judaism, in ethical monotheism, as we know it. Those women were putting up with so much as a result of the immorality of upper class Greco-Roman men. And as a result of the immorality of upper class Greco-Roman men, they were disillusioned with the situation it put them in and they were looking for something else. What was there in the ancient world? They looked to that strange religion from the East. They looked at ethical monotheism to Judaism. And that's quite common across the empire. There's this disillusioned group. Even Nero's mistress and later his wife, Papia, was known to have sympathies with the Jews and with their faith. We've had a lot of fuss recently about uh, what's happening in our land and gay marriage, so called, and all the rest of it. Immorality brings its own disillusionment. And that can lead to a readiness to accept Christ. And we're seeing that sort of thing in the synagogues of Thessalonica and Berea. Looking to the safe haven of Jewish ethical monotheism in the chaos and corruption of the time. Let us pray that God brings us people like that. Those people looking around the synagogue, they obviously hadn't dived into conversion to Judaism. They were left unsatisfied by the strong emphasis on the law. But they were satisfied by the glorious liberty of the sons of God, given birth by the awesome grace of God in the gospel. And Paul took his intentional evangelism to the synagogue in order to bring that gospel to bear with them. Paul met with them daily. A bit keener than the people in Thessalonica. It was every Sabbath up there. Oh yeah, we want to meet every day on this one. They examined the scriptures together. Upper class Greek men and women and Jews believed all sorts you wouldn't expect. All piling in together. And, just, and then... The disgruntled Jews from Thessalonica came over and they kicked up a mess and tried to disturb things. So what are the miss what's the missionary strategy and what are the responses? Paul turns up in town, there's no church to go to, he goes to synagogue, he goes to the religious times. And when he's there he picks up fringe people in some numbers. People who were disillusioned and looking and where did they end up? Well, there was only one place for them to go and they ended up there. It wasn't right. They weren't getting involved in that. But as soon as Paul turned up, hang on, that sounds better. Let's look in the Bible and see what that's about. That sounds good. That sounds right. And they came. Not so much stealing sheep because there were no actual shepherds there. Not so much stealing sheep as growing grass. Sheep are pretty good at finding. And opinion, of course, is divided. And trouble, of course, does start. And the apostles are not deterred, not deflected by thoughts of their own safety, but the safety of the new converts, Jason and the others, the Thessalonica, and off they go somewhere else, do the same again. Not deflected from their purpose, because there's a fuss about it. Now, of course, we know here in Andalo, wherever we are, we need to be distinct. We know that from manifestations of non-Vanilli Christian religion. 
which put a plug in the God-shaped hole in everybody's heart. But you know, it's like one of those plugs that doesn't quite fit, they've got silicon all around it. Yeah? Fill up the gap. We need to be distinct from all of that, but, but the apostles were not averse to evangelizing people in those settings, even though it was very hard. And the way they went about it was to reason with people. Not with a brick, but from the scriptures. Showing them that that there is this. Verse 2, Paul reasoned with them. Verse 3b, he explained to them. Verse 3c, he proclaimed to them. And the criticism and the false accusations, they just deflected that. All the while, drawing disciples looking for God in his word away with them, the most unexpected. And that is the biblical practice. Are there people that we've thought of in the past not being interested because they've got their own church. Have they? <laughs> Maybe they have. Maybe they haven't. And maybe there are people around those churches who are looking, but they're not convinced of what they're seeing. Perhaps for very good reason. And are there people in our place? Never mind Thessalonica, never mind Berea. Are there people around us in that position that we really ought to be praying a little bit more about? May God give us grace. This is the way.